Hey adventurers, welcome to the crew. I'm C. Lord Janda, and this is my let's play of Pillars of Eternity. In the last episode, we began exploring Brackenbury, saw a couple interesting things. We're now headed into the local sanatorium, which appears to be the main attraction of the place. Additionally, thanks to everybody for getting us to 100 subscribers. Hope you all have a great day. at it. Oh, yes, well, we are here to look for uh, an expert on awakenings. That is, I guess this is where the Animancers are, or something, so. Get guards, sure. The table is set with an assortment of leaflets and booklets with titles like Practical Benefits of Animancy and Soul Adjustment for the Well-Adjusted Soul. Okay. Free books. Verna. You sense a strange divide in this woman's soul, an unnatural boundary between two opposed wills. You see the woman pausing by a roadside to hand something to the driver of a stopped wagon. These herbs should help with his party's sickness, she tells you. You can find more along the road, easy to spot with their serrated leaves, but avoid the ones with the green berries. It's a different species, toxic. He thanks her and offers her coin, but she waves him off, explaining that she's merely doing what her order asks of her. He nods, and she heads off down the road as he begins to hungrily consume the herb. You see the woman searching along the roadway, the wagon just up the path, and you realize you've skipped backward in her memory. She sets her eyes on a plant with serrated leaves and green berries. She picks several handfuls, tearing the berries off one by one and tossing them to the ground. She nudges them off the path into the brush quickly with her boots without looking down as if to hide them from her own sight before striding back toward the wagon, hands outstretched. Oh. That's... why? What? Oh, this guy's talking to a statue. Fascinating. Ooh, my soul was kind of torn asunder by a Buick. The table set with an assortment of leaflets and booklets with titles like... Oh, same. Don't mind if I just loot your stuff. So who are you? I'm watching this little medical lecture. Hmm. Oh, permanent side effects, you say? I see, it's not going all that well. Then. Good day to you. Hi, Otmar. A bald man with a crooked nose gestures in demonstration over the still body of a patient before a small gathering of interested onlookers. Following, feeling your gaze, he pauses his discussion. Have you come to sit in? I'd like to know more about the sanitarium. He gives an eager nod. It's the mission that attracted me here. The treatment of the disturbed. No one else seems to care about them. Here, they've worked wonders for them. I've seen people cured of insatiable hungers and uncontrollable urges. I've seen the crippled walk and the dysphoric smile. All within these walls. The thought that the Duke could put an end to it with a single order it keeps me up nights. Oh. Good day to you. Uh, so what's you do here? Close as we are to the Glanfathen Wilds, we get a number of Beowick maimings every year. The survivors dealing with complications from exposure. This fellow here is a severe case. His essence is a mere whisper of what it was. I'm early in my research, only beginning to understand how they work. But in time, I hope to find a way to protect people from the storm's effects. Good day to you. Let me ask one question at a time. You know anything about awakenings? Not his area of expertise. All right. Well, it seems like he's doing good work. I uh, can't help but somebody was talking to this statue a minute ago. We'll come back to him, maybe. What your soul may be trying to tell you. Hmm. 
I'll read all these books eventually. I'm just taking them for now. Yarmid. You see a dark room with garish furnishings. A large bed covered with pillows, several couches, and expensive rugs. This man's sitting in a chair pushed back against the wall of the room opposite the door. He's dressed in dark clothes with a black cloak wrapped around his shoulders, its hood pulled close around his face. Shadows fall across him, the darkness rendering him virtually invisible. Two other men wait in the darkness with him, watching the door. All three are motionless. Noise from the crowded common room below echoes up through the floorboards. The handle rattles. A man staggers in, dragging a young woman with him. The two standing men exchange a quick glance, one of them tilting his head and shrugging only slightly before jumping to the task at hand. One steps forward, grabbing the girl's wrist, wrenching it from her escort's hold with one hand before pushing the door, a wall pushing the door closed with the other. Then that hand is over the girl's mouth before she's even aware she's in someone else's arms. He takes a dagger from its place on his belt and draws it across her neck. He holds her still, waits for the struggles to stop. The other standing man has already subdued their target, now tied to a chair, arms and legs bound with a rag stuffed in his mouth. The girl, no longer moving, is placed under the bed, the man who dealt with her taking his place beside the other. They stare down at the man screaming against the cloth, but the muffled sound is unheard over the ruckus noise of the crowd below. One of the men begins mur murmuring softly, putting his hand onto the chin of the man in the chair. There's a brief flash of light and the man stops struggling, a suddenly placid look in his eyes. The two captors ask various questions that the bound man answers happily. After they finish, the two look to the man sitting against the wall. He's not moved as the events transpired before him, but only sat, silently observing everything as it happened. He stands, holding the cloak closed around himself, and nods to the two men. He then walks to the door, opens it only far enough to allow himself to exit, and leaves them to finish their task. Well, that seems like, um... This is not... Not an ethical sort of fellow here. A lot of people with dark and twisted souls around, gotta say. These look like field sketches along with in ruins and artifacts. Ooh, downstairs. This painting of a rolling forest glen has a strangely soothing effect. Okay, there's another story, but let's head and talk to the statue first, eh? What's up, Head Warden? A well-maintained statue of a middle-aged man presides over the room, looking down on blinking over the bustle of harried academics pestered by the hopeful desperate. A strong warmth emanates from it that you could sense from across the room. There's a human soul stored beneath, beneath the stonework. You feel its attention turn towards you. It has been some time since a watcher graced these halls. His voice echoes deeply, rumbling the floor beneath you. I am envious of your natural insights, Traveler. I can only imagine how it might have helped my work in life. Now what is it that has brought you to my sanitarium? Um... Yeah, tell me about it. A history lesson? This is a rare pleasure. Most come in here only concerned with cheating death in one way or another. We're an old institution, as Deerwood goes. This is our 94th year. As with many cities, the growth of Defiance Bay brought with it a host of problems. One of the worst was that those born with, shall we say, ill-favored souls came to populate its streets in droves. Thus, the sanitarium. Brackenbury was a natural fit. It was growing, but there was also a lot of money here back then. This place owes its survival to the curiosities of the wealthy more than anything, I think. Our founding came at a time of great suspicion in animancy, much like today. So much progress has been lost to the mishaps of a few careless practitioners. But in time, it was forgotten as all things are. Since then, we've been at the forefront of Hanamancy's resurgence. We've played host to many gifted researchers and pushed the boundaries of our knowledge in ways never thought possible. Some of the first safe transferences were done here, and we've pioneered work in soul purification, lineage analysis, preservation. It's really quite a list, if you'll pardon my pride. Hmm. Today, it's... well, I can't say it's exactly the same. There's been some push to shut us down. It comes from Deerwood's more excitable denizens, whose minds are more passionate than thoughtful, I'm afraid. People see this... this legacy, and they see it involves something they don't understand. So it's natural for them to suspect people whose understanding exceeds theirs. 
It looks to them like we're hiding something. I can't imagine that happening now. We have a representative in the palace this very moment, defending the entire science of animancy at a hearing before the Duke, as absurd as it sounds. If it does not go well, it could be the end of animancy in Deerwood. I fear Avar may be swayed by all this unrest, irrational though it may be. We shall see. How would you come to be in your present state? In the statue, you mean? Well, he laughs, I was old, and it seemed wrong to me. A lifetime spent in pursuit of discovery, only to lose it all in death. Somewhere, someday, I would wake up in a new body, none the wiser, and pursue a different course entirely. All that experience wasted. If we're ever to unearth the principles behind our condition, it will be in spite of our condition. Of that, I am quite sure. To live on as part of something I helped build seemed to me a better legacy than what nature had in store. The transfer itself was quite simple as our techniques go, and for that I'm grateful. Playing with souls is far easier to accept when they're not your own. I do miss being able to take an active role in the scholarly efforts here. Now and again one of our animancers will humor me and consult over some problem, but they're a jealous breed and are too often afraid to collaborate. If you're considering it yourself, I can tell you it isn't for the easily bored. Well, does anybody know anything about awakenings? There's an animancer on the lower floor who came all the way from Revwa to study them. Take the stairs down and look for Bella Siege. Also, uh, you may have a member of the Leaden Key in your midst. Ethelmer more groans and the stone around him shudders. I could have done without hearing that today. Many have their intrusions been into our affairs. Of course, one can seldom be certain whether they've meddled or whether calamity has struck on its own. But a few of their less skilled infiltrators have been exposed from time to time. They are a perpetual nuisance. I see. Once again, I'm reminded of how envious I am of your gifts. I suspect they would be of some use in verifying one's identity. You are at odds with the leaden key as well, I take it? Well, they're up to something, and I'm trying to figure out what. <laughs> they are always up to something. Of that you may rest assured. If their plots have come to involve you, you have my sympathies. Do you have some idea of who this person might be? Um, I won't know until I've met them. Very well. In that case, I'd recommend you speak first with our resident animancers. They have frequent interactions with both patients and colleagues. You'll find them up here in, or in their offices downstairs. You'll report anything suspicious to me immediately. This is my only request. That seems reasonable. Doesn't seem like he likes the light and key much. Okay, I'm looking for an animator named Modred. Modred. Of course, you'll find him downstairs in the first room on the right. Okay, hold on. I've got, like... Is one of these... Alright, one of these is... Ah, this is probably the place of misery and madness. That kind of makes sense, yeah. So we've got a main quest here. Probably. We've got... To find the next bird on Awakenings... And we've got to retrieve Helig's research from Modred's laboratory. Man, we got a lot of quests that are in here, actually. Three, at least. Okay. Um, I only actually saw one Animancer. Let me go talk to this guy again real quick. Good day, stranger. Uh, he doesn't have anything to say. Um, did we see any other that we could question. Not up here, really. I think we probably gotta go downstairs. Stairs. I see. Perhaps I should quick save before we explore downstairs then. 
Oh, found Modrin. That didn't take long. Um, in a corner of Modrin's lab rests a large weathered trunk. It seems likely to contain something important, if only by virtue of its size. Leave it alone for a second. Let's see what else we got. Unexpected results. The canine host was listless and unresponsive, but it was determined that this was simply the implanted feline soul. Yarn resulted in vigorous stimulation. Bro, you put a cat's soul into a dog? Why? And I mean, a man sir scribbles feverishly on a parchment scroll while his free hand dances through the air, counting off unseen objects. His lips move in silent discourse. As your shadow falls over his scroll, he looks up at you with mingled perplexity and irritation. Adieu. Can I help you? He forces a polite smile. Uh, the name Helig mean anything to you? Modred starts. Helig, he was, is, I mean, a colleague of mine. He was primarily a necromancer, but he was involved in animancy too. He worked at the sanitarium for several years. I dare say everyone here's heard of him. He clears his throat. He left his post recently. I believe he was seeking new opportunities in the Valian Republics. He leans forward. The advances they're making in animancy really are quite remarkable. Surely you've heard. He coughs again. Perhaps you haven't. Yeah, okay, you know a woman named Rowena? No, I don't get out of the sanitarium much. I've heard it differently. He slides his spectacles down his nose. Just what are you insinuating? This is your idea of a joke, I assure you. It's in very poor taste. So you didn't stab him and dump him in the catacombs? Boy, he'll be relieved to hear it. Motred pales. How could... He sighs and runs a hand over his hair. Very well. Yes, I killed him. And I killed that beast because nobody else had the spine for it. He was a madman. Years of perverse experiments. Twisting healthy souls. Torturing damaged souls. And for what? He flayed the essence from Glanfoth and indigents for his amusement. He waves down the hall. If the public had known half of his deeds, they'd have raised this place to the ground. He jabs his finger on the desk. He used the sanitarium to disguise his own sick proclivities. He brought shame on all of us and put the entire discipline at risk. I regret nothing. He calms down and sizes you up. Anyway, now you know the whole grisly story. Um, well, his soul is back in his corpse and he wants revenge. No doubt. He spreads his hands wide. But now you understand why I killed him. Why someone had to. If he sent you, I can only hope I can convince you to return and slay him once and for all. Uh, he stole a grimoire. His grimoire? What's that madman been telling you? Yeah, he said he keeps you in the trunk over there. Motred takes the key with a trembling hand, his eye darting to the trunk behind you. You've been misled. There's no grimoire here, and Helic never intended you to find one. Why did I give him the key? Grief. That wretched thing has an insatiable hunger for blood. He shudders. Thank you for denying him. I hope I can convince you now to return and slay him once and for all. He has something I need. I don't know what he's promised you, but he's already lied to you about the grimoire. I don't have it. If what I've told you about that evil, deceitful man hasn't swayed you, I don't know what else to say. He turns back to his papers. Trust him at your own peril. Hmm. I don't know if I trust, uh... Moses that player. much on this either. What you're working on, anyway. My area of focus is wicks. More specifically, how to cure them. It's a wicked. A hollowborn who received a transplanted animal soul during infancy. One of Animancy's early efforts to cure the legacy, if not a successful one. He removes his spectacles and wipes his brow. They show signs of developmental abnormalities throughout their childhood, but when they reach adolescence, they become aggressive. Feral. But... Still victims in need of care. Why was that the solution? We, Animancers, were trying to do something about the crisis. Better than letting it swallow a generation of children. He stares at a fixed point in the far wall. And despite the controversy, it only went so far because at first it seemed to work. People called it the salvation. Children that had never been responsive to any kind of stimuli suddenly seemed to wear of their surroundings, of their families. He takes a slow breath. The complications don't begin until puberty. But that's when the incompatibilities between body and soul take shape. Children become violent, ravenous. We paid dearly for our mistake, I promise you. Angry mobs hunted down animators and burned down their homes, with them still inside often as not. People took to call it, calling it the cruel salvation, and many still loathe us for it. But we wanted to stop the legacy as much as anyone. The public begged for our help, and we did the best we could. I still don't know if that absolves us. 
Why do you study them? He huffs. What kind of question is that? Just think of all the families that could be healed, the lives that could be restored. What could be more important? His face is reddened, and he turns away from you for a moment. He shakes his head. Animitsy has an answer here. I know it. It's simply a matter of working it out. I see. Anything unusual around here? Yeah, you must be joking. This is the sanitarium. Nothing is usual down here. He pauses. Although now I think of it, the patients seem more agitated lately. But they're Kate Manazo's responsibility, not mine. Nothing else? Oh, just looking around. Then be quick about it and don't touch anything. The sanitarium has a lax visitor policy, but I don't. Without another word, he resumes his work. Hmm. I see. I can't open the trunk anymore, and I feel like maybe I should have. Hello! Say, you know anything about awakenings? Talk to the Valian woman. What if I just... Stole the pet key back from him? I don't know. Helly does not strike me as a good guy here, but I'm kind of doubting Mordred also. Hmm. I'll think on that one. This is the person we were supposed to talk to about souls, I think. This or awakenings. This strange device seems to thrum with power. Bellis. A woman paces back and forth, her feet crunching on the soft red carpet. She gestures and mumbles to herself, shaking her head as she pours over pages of notes. She almost walks into you. Ekosi. Here I am, looking so hard for answers in my research that I don't see the kith standing in front of me. What can I do? Um, what do you do here? According to my research grant, I study awakenings. Sublimating pre-awakened souls has been one of Animancy's greatest successes, and I'm working on a method to replicate the process on awakened souls. She gnaws at her lip. Okay. But the truth is, I find few suitable subjects here. Wide One's legacy has left plenty of awakened souls, but most are too broken for study. I fear I'll return to Revu with nothing to show for my efforts. Um, well, I'm awakened. She scratches her chin. Most interesting, but not the kind of awakening I can study, I'm afraid. I need someone whose awakened soul can be triggered with predictable stimuli. Souls such as these tend to manifest as alternate personas in the host. She gives you a broad, if strange, smile. But I thank you for the offer. Well, hold on. Uh, I still have, um... I think Aloth is who's supposed to really do this. What do you know, what do you know about animates in the Valian Republics? It's a dynamic and respected field. Even the Bail Reach incident did little to slow it. She shrugs. People in the Republics are more accepting of risks. Less superstitious. Ready to try anything that shows promise. Um... It's a shame so many people are hostile to it. It is, but such is the way of the Deerwood. The people here are fierce about their sovereignty, but they're not so independent from their adherent brothers. Uh, and their Golanfatha neighbors, as they'd like to think. They rely too much on the mysterious workings of the gods and fear the very advances they need. Um. Okay. I still need an expert on awakenings. She laughs bitterly. Ah, that would be me. Though the lack of research subjects has made me more of an expert in counting floorboards. I'd like to transfer Animancy's success in buttressing pre-awakened souls to soothing those whose souls have already awakened. But I need subjects, and most of the patients here are too broken to produce reliable results. It's a tragedy to have come so far for nothing. Okay, yes, a loth will volunteer. She springs to the balls of her feet, beaming. Gillard! Who is it? Aloth's lips curl into a frown. I don't know about this. She grins more broadly still. Don't be silly. The process is perfectly harmless. All you must do is stand in that cage over there. <laughs> Have fun, Aloth. I beg your pardon. I jest. You and Deerans are so uptight. I don't even know what the thing's used for. It belonged to the last occupant of this office, I think. Now they upgrade him to a cell. A again, I jest. She rubs her hands together, getting down to business. So, I need you to sit here. She takes Aloth by the shoulders and steers him to the couch. 
and try to relax. But don't try too hard, then you'll not be relaxing. Indeed. His eyes are humorless. And you must also wear these, a little cold, but the copper will help conduct your essence. The Anomancer fastens thick copper bands to a lost forehead and wrists. As she ratchets them tighter, his face twitches with suppressed irritation. Now, I'll examine your soul through my scope. She reaches into her desk and produces a long, chambered tube. Knobs, dials, and small toothed wheels run along the side of the device. It's fitted with Adra lenses, cut to different thicknesses and concavities. By manipulating them, I find the angles and densities that will allow me to track the anomalies in your soul. Well, that sounds fun. Good luck, Aloth. How exciting. I've never seen this, this sort of thing performed. Khan appears at the device with interest. It seems suitably complicated. Does this mean we'll get to talk to Eselmere more? I like that lady. She raises a finger. But first, we must find this cunning interloper. You'll answer some personal questions while I make adjustments. Scanny pats his arm. Don't worry, I'm sure we won't hear any of it. A loth squirms on the couch. Very well. She holds the scope to her eye and flicks a knob. To begin, tell me something personal. Something from a time before your awakening. There's nothing to tell. I was just a normal child living in the Sithwood. He looks to you. His face is set in a frown, but the rigid edges of apprehension show through never nevertheless. Uh, talk about your parents, maybe. As you speak to a loth, you feel your voice like a bell in your chest. It tolls softly, luring him into the mists of his own memory. Belisich doesn't seem to notice anything, but you feel as if your words are smoothing his essence, untangling its many threads. He closes his eyes. Mother is away most of the time, with the Thane's family, but I always know when she's coming home. Father's bottles accumulate like storm clouds on the horizon. His fits of temper become swifter and more violent. It still shames him, knowing that her hamnig to another man supports us better than his labors as a steward. This is good. I'm starting to see something. Continue. Tell us about the time you awakened. She bites her tongue as she twists one of the dials. I'm in my fifth year of training. Mother is home. I can let my guard down a little because when she's around, he's usually only angry with her. But he's heard that I've had trouble casting missiles, that my flame shields are unstable. He's furious that I've failed, and Mother's presence reminds him that he has failed, too. The first blow takes me by surprise. One moment I'm sweeping the kitchen, the next I'm sprawled on the ground, stupidly looking at flecks of my blood on the tile. His boots, glistening with fresh polish, thud across the floor. He kicks me in the stomach, and I curl up to shield my vitals. But it's pointless. Protecting one thing only leaves something else exposed. Still huddled on the ground, I retreat as fast as I can. I retreat until the vision of the kitchen and my own trembling knees is nothing but a pinprick against a field of black. His jaw locks, and his eyes twitch beneath their lids. Matico, Bella Sage furiously cranks the knob's longer scope. He's hypnotized himself with this old memory. You've got to bring him out of it. Quickly, I almost have it. Uh, Aloth, wake up. Aloth's eyes snap open, but the expression you see in them isn't his. You've scuttled him off. A wilting daisy, that one. But as he sucks a deep breath through her teeth. That's it. I'm seeing a shift in his essence. Something spreading and congealing. She glances at you over her scope. Keep talking. He seems to respond to you. What brought you here? Craking bones and voices high and higher. That warm molasses feeling that crips down your gut when crisis is nigh. Belfetto! We have flares of a totally distinct essence. She jots shorthand notes onto the pages next to her and turns one clicking knob of her scope. Now try to get the two of them talking. Uh, Isolmir, tell Loth why you've awakened. Why, he's the one needed me, hiding in his own bone bag like a turtle in its shell. Loth's face twists in fury. I never turned it over to you. Good, yes, very good. She rests from her scribbling only to make another adjustment to her scope. I can now see two separate patterns of essence. Where he ebbs, the other flows. It's as if the awakened soul fills the spaces that he leaves empty. She prompts you with a circling of her wrist, quill still in hand. Go on. Aloth, what's this about ceding space to Isolmere? He grits his teeth painfully. I've given her nothing. She usurps me in my own body. I and I lend him a pair, too. You should ask what I did with that old man of his. How the last time he laid a hand on us, I break it in three places. Aloth's head jerks to the side. 
That wasn't your decision. It's never been your decision. And I was awakening, but now I'm stuck with you and damned if I let your ninnying drag us both through the scupper. Ah, very good. She lowers her scope and consults her notes. I think I finally got something we can work with. I've tracked Diesel Moon's essence throughout the exchange. She had a particularly high density index during the most heated portions of their argument, and her essence seems to localize most clearly in the lower portion of the subject's left ribcage. That's right around the spleen, which of course means she's triggered by black bile. No doubt the subject's characteristic melancholy is to blame. Oh god, oh no, all right, that's not our medical knowledge is fading fast here. Olaf blinks back at you, and in the midst of his perturbation, you're not quite sure who's looking out of his eyes. That's utter horseshit. <laughs> Sakani's eyes are wide and innocent. It does seem as though she got one thing right. She, she glares at him. Yes, never mind my years of training. I suppose you have a better explanation. Um, yeah, I lost right. That's absurd. Isomir obviously shows up when he feels threatened. Just take his spleen out. Sure, that'll fix it. Bella Sage carefully scratches her jaw, her gaze darting between you and Oloth. I suppose that could be true. She jots another note. I'll have to check this against other research. Oloth removes the copper bands. Well and good for you, but what does this mean for me? Bella Sage frowns at her notes, tapping her cheek with a quill and making a grand show of concentration. However, you catch her stealing a glance at you over the pages. Hmm. Well, maybe hear her out, Oloth. If you had to listen to her half as much as I do, you wouldn't say that. He scowls, but you notice something thoughtful in his frown. I've got a lot to process. Regardless, thank you for your help, Sea Lord. He doesn't look at Bella Sage. She sets her notes on her desk and returns to her scope. Well, I hope this has been as useful to you as it has been to me. I finally have material worth publishing. You'll be the toast of Revoa, Fentrae Loth. His grimace melts into a crooked smile. I advancing the right-wise principles of animancy. Just what you've always wanted. As you turn to leave, you catch a darting movement out of the corner of your eye. Bellacy just humming to herself, still occupied with her scope, but Loth's holding your notes. He's just about to tuck them into his cloak when he catches you watching. He holds a finger to his lips, his eyes wide and imploring. Please, I don't want my personal information published like this, especially not after her nonsense. Well, she was kind of useless. I mean, she tried to say it was your spleen. All right, leave me out of it. None of my business. He hides the papers in his cloak. Not to worry. We'll see to this on our own. I'm here. I feel a little bad for Bella Siege, maybe, but uh, she was kind of like her advice was very bad, so. Ripley. One of these is still like an imposter or something, I think. Those two were... Oh, I should have read that note. Um... Where did that go? Ripley, I require more copper tubing for my next experiment. Do not requisition it from the sanitarium stores. I don't have the time to deal with the head warden's inevitable questions. Cade Manazzo. I wonder if Cade Manazzo is the guy we gotta worry about then. Yeah. Well What's your met, deal, friend. Ripley? A young Orlin woman traces her fingers along the spines of the books in front of her, row by row. Her motion's quick and skittish like a bird's. She doesn't notice you until you're nearly upon her. Oh my, you startled me. Are you supposed to be in here? Mm, what do you do here? I mostly help Master Ozzo set up and clean his equipment. I also keep his office organized since he's too busy to do it himself. Oh, this is Ozzo's office, I see. If there's nothing else, I need to get back to work. Uh, yeah, Bella Siege is still the person, so... Can't really break into that. That's very locked. Who's over here? Oh, this one's empty. The edges of the cage are dented and scored with claw marks. What 
the hell have you guys had in these cages? I think, I think it should be people, but... Not healthy people, clearly. Okay, so, as far as quests go, oh yeah, we gotta talk to the statue. Welcome! Have you learned anything of interest? Maybe. Is Cade Manazu running experiments on the patients here? Experiments? Cade Manazu's in charge of patient welfare now. He's not authorized to run any more experiments. I am disappointed in Cade Man. I'd hope to be the one to guide your inquiry. He'll be in his office or in the patient wards. I'm granting you immediate access so you can find him. No doubt you wish to speak to him further on this matter. But I, for one, am curious as to what he might have to say. Tread carefully in the wards. There are a few dangerous cases. I'd also ask that you do your best not to agitate the patients. They have enough trouble as it is. All right, fair enough. Back to the patient ward then. I assume that's what was behind the door that we couldn't get through. Clearly there's some, uh, not entirely ethical business going on here. Probably also is the agent of the leaden key, or he's just unethical, but we're very close to leveling up. Nice. Oh. Thanks for watching, adventurers. New parts will be up every other day, or you can watch live on Twitch. If you did enjoy the video, consider leaving a like or subscribing. Have a nice day, adventurers. This is Sea Lord Janda, signing off.